Welcome to another session of food packaging technology. So in the previous class, we had discussed about packaging systems. And in today's class, we are going to discuss about product characteristics and packaging requirements. So food characteristics, it is influenced by internal and external parameters. Under the internal parameters, we have nutrients, moisture, pH, and its physical structure. And under the external parameters, we have temperature, atmosphere, that is presence and absence of oxygen, and packaging. So these characteristics, they determine the shelf life and the preservation methodologies that need to be adopted. And based on this only, we choose the packaging materials. Now, the food contains many components. The major components are moisture, proteins, carbohydrate, fats, and we have micro components like minerals and vitamins and some roughage which is contributed by fibers. Then moisture it is a very important component and it is the main reason why a food gets spoiled. So it is always necessary that moisture need to be removed or it need to be arrested so that microorganisms they will not survive and they will not multiply. It can be moisture content or water activity. Moisture content is a quantitative amount of water, whereas water activity is a qualitative value. And moisture content, it determines or gives an idea about bound water and free water. In a food product, we have free water. It is the water that comes out easily. And bound water is something which is held in position by the macro component. So it binds tightly to the macro components like carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And it is not easy to release them. So, and this is uh, not available for microorganisms, but free water is something which can be reduced or the amount can be removed so that microorganisms will not utilize them. And water activity, it concentrates on the amount of free water and it is the measurement of energy status of the water in a system. So, it's a qualitative value and both moisture content and water activity are important when we have to understand about the microbial growth or shelf life or the how it is going to influence the product quality. Now moisture content, it is the difference in weight before drying and after drying upon the initial weight and it is expressed in percentage whereas water activity, it is the ratio of vapor pressure of food and the vapor pressure of pure water. So it is in concentration with the pure water. Now if you look at the figure here, it shows the water activity and moisture content of different food products. So if you look at the initial part, the water activity it ranges from 0.1 to 0.9 and you have potato chips, crackers, they are extremely dry products which has a water activity of 0.1 to 0.3 and most of the microorganisms they will not thrive at these conditions. Whereas products like fruits and vegetables, milk, meat, fish, they have high water activity is almost near to 0.9 and 1 and at the same time they have high moisture content also. So they are more prone to microbial attack, they will deteriorate easily and they, hence they need a good preservation and packaging system. So similarly, in, if we plot a relative reaction rate, that is a reaction rate of food as a function of water activity and moisture content, we can understand many activities that may happen inside the product. So let's see uh, the enzymatic activity over here. So at 0.3 water activity, that is food that has low water activity, the enzyme activity is less. Uh, but as the moisture content increases, the enzyme activity also increases and the moisture content is also high. So if the enzymatic activity increases, the autolysis may also happen and uh, lipids may also undergo hydrolytic rancidity. That is why you can see here it is coming down here. So the lipid is getting deteriorated and high moisture content, it may contribute to enzymatic browning reactions. It may also contribute to mold growth, yeast growth, bacterial growth. So you have high water activity and high moisture content. All the microbes will grow in this region. So we can connect all these activities, the biochemical and physical activities uh, that may happen inside the food. The changes that may happen in the food, they can be connected to water activity and moisture content. Similarly, protein, it is the second most important component. Again, we have plant-based protein and animal-based protein. So you can see here, there are different pulses are given, which are rich in protein. 
and soya it's a plant protein avocado is also a plant protein and we have animal based proteins chicken egg we have all animal meats it, the cheese dairy products these are animal based proteins and basically the animal based proteins they are considered as complete proteins so it contains all the essential amino acids now proteins they have many functions the major ones are it supports the expression of dna and rna and it is essential for hormones or body function other metabolic activities it supports the body and above all it's the main component of muscle so it helps in contraction and movement and it's also important as a part of digestive enzymes antibodies so it has numerous functions and a proper functioning of the body protein is very essential and usually we get protein from our food what we eat so it can be from either plant sources or it can be from the animal sources now why protein is important we need protein so that malnutrition can be avoided then protein need to be protected and for that we need a proper preservation and proper packaging system that's how we have to relate to the components so protein it may undergo denaturation that is usually what we see the different structures are there primary secondary tertiary and quaternary structures of proteins are there these get denatured and the protein it loses its integrity and these are irreversible denaturations once it is denatured the protein loses its integrity and one such example is albumin which is water soluble it becomes insoluble when it is subjected to heating so it is a basic example that can be shown and again the next most important component is fat we can get fat from plant sources we can also get it from animal sources fish it is known for pufa that is polyunsaturated fatty acids and oil sardines are also rich in pufa and pufa it has many health benefits it protects heart it protects brain and it has many other benefits similarly plant fats also fat it's a combination of glycerol and fatty acids so we have a backbone of glycerol so that you can see here in the figure the this red balls it shows the glycerol part and these are the fatty acids so this together it forms the fat and we can have three different fatty acids or we can have a single type of fatty acids and fatty acids they can be saturated and unsaturated so you all know that saturated fatty acids means it has single bond throughout and unsaturated fatty acid it will be having one or more double bonds which starts from the methyl end so in case of this fatty acid this is the methyl end that is the omega end and from here the at the third position we have a double bond so it is a omega 3 fatty acid now why do we require fat again fat helps in brain development it is a component of cell it helps in absorbing shock fat also contains uh, fat soluble vitamins so which is also very important vitamins they are very important and it is also important for heart health and it's a source of energy so it has numerous benefits in the body and again if we need our fat to be protected we need to adopt suitable preservation and, and the food need to be protected well and lipids they undergo oxidation and this is a very common oxidation pathway that is oxidative density or auto oxidation the unsaturated lipids where double bonds are there they are converted to peroxy radicals which leads to rancidity the spoilage of fat is called rancidity and this is done in three steps that is initiation propagation and termination so here we see that initiation is given it unsaturated fatty acid it is converted to lipid radical and this process continues in the presence of oxygen and water so if we have an antioxidant we can terminate this reaction or else it will continue the process will continue and all lipid will be oxidized and the product will become rancid and as a part of rancidity hydroperoxides it may interact with proteins it may interact with amino acids which may lead to denaturation which may also lead to discoloration and it may also produce by products like ketones alcohols aldehydes hydrocarbons epoxides which will also add to the rancid flavor so that that is one aspect and also it will cause loss of flavors loss of vitamins so once the lipid is lost even the fat soluble vitamins are lost these are the indirect effects of fat oxidation the idea behind food preservation 
is to protect all these components and when we adopt the preservation that uh, product need to be protected well. Now this is again it shows the oxidative stress. So we have a ripe tomato here and tomato it undergoes stress and it is spoiled. This normal cell, it, the free radicals, it attacks the cell and it is subjected to oxidative stress and it is lost, the cell integrity is lost. So this is what observe in many food products. So this can be reduced, oxidative rancidity can be reduced if you, if you can reduce the temperature or there is no uh, water. So for this, if you take the suitable packaging material where it has high gas barrier properties or water barrier properties, you can protect the particular food. Now next product is carbohydrate. Again, carbohydrates are very important because they are source of energy. They are directly related to, they undergo glycolysis and ATP molecules are generated and you all know ATP is the powerhouse of energy and all living organisms, they need energy. And uh, these are the different sources. We have vegetables, uh, cereals and oil seeds, which are the source of carbohydrates. They can be monosaccharides, disaccharides and polysaccharides. And uh, these are simple, simple and complex forms of carbohydrates. And under polysaccharides, we have starches, fibers, which are plant polysaccharides. Glycogen is an animal polysaccharide. And then simple sugars, they are again, depending upon the number of monomers we have, it, they can be monosaccharide and disaccharide. And monosaccharide examples can be glucose, fructose, and galactose. And disaccharide can be maltose, lactose, and sucrose. Now, carbohydrate, it may undergo many deterioration. It may be the carbohydrates may undergo, it may be converted to smaller moieties which may un again further undergo deterioration or degradation which will be converted to acids and this will also reduce the pH. Then this will also play with the texture. Texture is also influenced by the carbohydrate. So in plants you will find the cellulose and hemicellulose and lignin. They are the building blocks. So degradation of carbohydrate will influence the textural changes or it will lead to textual changes. Again, it is involved in browning reaction. Free sugars, they will participate in browning reactions and lead to the formation of furfural or myelad byproducts, which will lead to browning in products. For example, we have browning in apple when it is cut and exposed to oxygen, the surface turns to brown. And similarly for potato, when it is cut, the surface gets brown. That is one reason that caramelization is charring of sugar. Caramel is used in, in developing cakes because it adds flavor. But caramelization happens when sugar is exposed to high temperature. So free sugars, they react together and byproducts are formed. So these are some of the reactions that carbohydrate will show when it is subjected to high temperature or high pressure in proper conditions. And ATP, this is an example of in fish, ATP. It undergoes degradation when the fish is killed. It is converted to hyposanthine. Hyposanthine is a bitter compound and it parts bitterness to the flesh. So generally the degradation of ATP to inosin. So when the animal is dead, it, one phosphate is lost at each step and ATP is converted to ADP and then AMP and IMP. And this is again converted to inosin. So this is a slow process, but from inosin to hyposanthine, it is a quick process. And once hyposanthine is formed, the fish will become bitter in taste and it is designated or it is denoted by K value and K value indicates the freshness of it. And this de degradation happens in the post-mortal conditions when the fish is already dead. So this is also kind of biochemical change that is observed in the body of animal. Then we have micronutrients like vitamins and minerals. Vitamins, again, they are water-soluble vitamins like B-complex vitamins and vitamin C. We also have uh, fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, K, and then minerals, major minerals and trace elements. So all these elements we recover from food. For example, fish is rich in iodine, chocolate is rich in molybdenum. So these uh, minerals we get from food. And only when food is protected, when it is in safe condition, it is well preserved, only then these nutrients can reach to the consumer. And based on the nutritional characteristics, the foods are grouped into nine categories. They are cereals, uh, starchy roots, legumes, vegetable and fruits, 
sugar preserves and syrups, meat, fish and egg, milk and milk products, fats and oils and beverages. So these nine categories are very important and accordingly the packaging conditions need to be chosen. And this uh, table, it shows different products, different food products and their uh, different composition. So here you can see that each food has their own unique components. It is not same in all the cases. It is different from each other. And if we have to protect the components, the packaging material or the packaging system has to be chosen accordingly. Now this is banana cultivars, different varieties of banana. Basically they are all banana but then within the banana we can find variations. So water content is differing. We have lowest water content 66 percentage in one variety and it goes up to 74 percent in another variety. So moisture content itself is varying in one single fruit. It depends upon the cultivar. So cultivar to cultivar also we need to check and uh, accordingly we have to use the package material. Now so my plate concept earlier food chain was in the pyramid concept now it is my plate so the plate should contain balanced amount of fruits, vegetables, proteins, grains so proteins can be any source it need not be animal protein it can be plant protein and uh, it can be dairy proteins also so it should be uh, for a healthy lifestyle we need to see that it is in a balanced state and all these criteria are being met. Now major causes of food spoilage it can be categorized into physical, chemical and microbial and others. Physical parameters that are responsible for spoilage will be temperature, uh, relative humidity, uh, light, mechanical damage and chemical uh, spoilages may happen because of enzymatic reaction, non-enzymatic reaction, the acidity, then chemical interaction, microbials due to microbes like bacteria, yeast and mold. Along with this, we can have insects, rodents which may damage the food product. So unless we know what are the different spoilages that may happen in a particular food and from what it need to be protected, we cannot select a packaging material. So the packaging material, when we select it, we have to understand what is the main cause from what it has to be, the product need to be protected from. Shown here some spoilages, the bread, it is spoiled, mold growth is there. So bread, it should be protected from moisture so that moisture will not enter into it. So the packaging material need to be selected accordingly, similarly for other food products also. And uh, therefore, the first step of uh, protecting the food will be adopting a food preservation method. And generally, food preservation, we go for physical methods and chemical methods. Physical methods will be drying, chilling, freezing, canning, smoking, pasteurization. And chemical methods, we include salting, pickling and sugaring. So these are conventional methods. This which enhance the shelf life of the food product, either by reducing the water activity or making the water unavailable for microbial growth and uh, multiplication. So these are the different preservation methods that we adopt for preserving food, for extending their shelf life at the same time without any change to the nutrition. But nowadays more and more studies are being done on non-thermal preservation methods like high pressure processing, microwave preservation method, ohmic heating, the UV sterilization. So these preservations don't use the heat and thereby they protect the food. So with this, let's wind up for today. And in this session, we had discussed about different food components, the macro components and micro components, and what are the significance of these components in food and why we need to protect this. Considering these components, we have to choose the packaging materials and packaging characteristics need to be decided accordingly. So let's wind up for today. Thank you.